Good evening. Good evening, sir. This is important stuff. I'm in no hurry. We've been at this for 10 hours, and I think that the fact of the matter is, uh, when, when your job, when your job is not being done to the standards that you have just described, people die. It is life and death. So uh, this is many, many important issues. Uh, let's start with maybe from left, from my left to right. Is it Ms. No Nohowski? It, my name is uh, Nikki Breit. Penny gave the written testimony. Nikki, what's your last name again? It's Nikki Breit, B-R-A-T-E, and I'm a vice president Breit. with PATH. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it, I won't uh, belabor the testimony. I. Um, I think it's important uh, that we recognize that uh, I do not prescribe to uh, the director's testimony here in a rosy picture that was uh, was put forward. I am uh, very fearful that the data of New Yorkers is not being properly kept. Uh, that I don't think you're suggesting uh, that we uh, eliminate people with uh, knowledge and appropriate expertise to come in and help. But you're just saying as a replacement for those workers, uh, you're uh, objecting to. So I, I think, is that, do I have that message correct? Can you repeat what you just said? Yeah, it, it, the, it, what I gather from your message was that you objected to uh, certain uh, consultants uh, taking over the workload of uh, otherwise state employees that are entrusted uh, with uh, taking an oath of office and ensuring that uh, they uh, protect the, the data and the information that's existing. Is that not correct? So what, what I uh, was saying is that we have, very, uh, we have a very talented workforce and absolutely sometimes you will need to augment some of that with the consultants, but outsourcing all of that is taking out a lot of that institutional knowledge that will provide that future protection and the institutional knowledge that we have and the, and the members that built those systems know those systems and that is why we need to keep this workforce in play. Well, I, and I'm not going to go overboard with that mm -hmm. because frankly the world is changing rapidly mm -hmm. and that the state has an obligation to come in to provide the best minds with the most experience in the quickest possible time. So my recommendation is you don't fight that, you work with it. And if it becomes to the point where you have suggested that the security is jeopardized because of privateers coming in and doing all the work or a substantial amount of the work or a amount of the work that uh, is uh, detrimental uh, to the safety and security of the data, then we need to know about it. But don't fight those that are trying, and I guess that's the sense that I have is that the technology department suggests it uses a major consultant, but I'm not sure to what extent, and maybe you could give us an offline, off this testimony report on exactly what is being provided. Uh, because I, I left that testimony uh, shaking my head because, not your testimony, but the testimony of the IT director uh, shaking my head because I am, don't have a clear picture. I don't believe any member of the panel has a clear picture of what uh, she is describing. Um, going uh, to... Uh, Steve Drake. To, yes. St to Steve? Yes. Um, I've been around a long, <laughs> long time. I uh, worked with Dave Stallone many years ago, remember the name familiar to you? Absolutely. That we uh, got those Persona. antique pagers uh, into you, except they were high tech, uh, cutting edge at the time. 20 years ago is a long time in the technical world. Uh, those things are necessary to the teachers in our correctional system, absolutely. I'm shocked they haven't been upgraded in all this period of time. Uh, do you have uh, specific proposals relative to upgrading and the protecting? We can provide you that information. Would you do that yes. and do it uh, uh, quickly? That's what Dave Sloan did Absolutely. 20 years ago. I hope you'll uh, follow up in that, uh, in that path. Absolutely. But, uh, Paul, I, I don't know if you heard any of the comments I made during the uh, questioning of uh, Commissioner Anucci. I did, sir. That, um, 
these staffing ratios are the structural problem that is creating a dangerous situation. I think that's the bottom line. That's your bottom line. Uh, certainly there are uh, people who are trying to do the best in changing protocols and providing additional infrastructure and equipment. But with these kind of ratios, I don't know how effective that will be. Please comment. Yes, sir. Uh, the ratios nowadays are unacceptable, and I think that's where the system is failing nowadays. I mean, it's failing the community because community safety is being jeopardized. It's failing the, the parolee because the parolee is not getting the service in which they used to receive. I mean, the relationship and the bond between the parole officer and the parolee cannot be undermined. And when you don't see a person for three, four months at a time, and you don't get to meet mom, you know, when I used to visit my parolees when I was a parole officer, I'd be out there two, three, four times a month. The parents knew me, the sisters knew me, the kids knew me. Hey, Mr. Rigby, how are you? You built that bond, you built that relationship because they tell you, hey, Johnny's not doing right, Mr. Rigby. And when you don't see these people, we got a disconnect nowadays and it's causing the problems. And if the parolee does relapse and he starts using drugs, we don't know about it sometimes three, four months down the road. And then we're losing them by that time because it's going too far along. If you drop the numbers back down to something was manageable and a parole officer could have an active contact with a parolee in the community, we'd be much safer and we'd be much more successful. Commissioner Nucci only gave you the rate of recidivism for a person committing a felony. Right now, our rate of recidivism for a pro violator is about 49%. And we have many different alternative uh, programs they have in there. And another problem they have is that they have us doing a lot of duties which we never did before. I know, you know, I thank you know, everybody in here because about five years ago, one of our pro officers was shot and killed in Man uh, shot and injured in Manhattan at the office. We put metal detectors in there. And then the state de developed an ISO item to guard our metal detectors. But what happens right now is that when that ISO officer is no longer able to uh, man that metal detector, the department has parole officers, grade 21s, doing grade 9 work. They will not run an academy until they have five empty items. We waste tens of thousands of hours, parole officers, taken out of the community to work a grade 9 militector because they refuse to run the academies. And it's not acceptable. Those parole officers need to be in the community. They need to be having contact with these parolees to help them succeed. It, uh, just I'm out of time, so uh, in terms of, I know others want to speak, but uh, thank you very much for uh, focus on this and uh, please continue to provide us the input we need uh, to help change these policies. Thank you, Senator. We'll now hear from Assemblymember O'Donnell. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Mr. Rigby. You're not from New York City, but you speak as fast as Mr. Lynch, <laughs> which is quite an accomplishment. And the way you say Manhattan, I know you're not from New York City. So, um, uh, one of the problems is you have an, a huge amount of information with a lot of acronyms and letters that I've come to know what a lot of them are, but many people don't, okay? So I want to start first with the definition section. In the day, 20 years ago, no one got out of prison until the parole board said, you can go. So everyone had a sentence with two numbers. It was two to six or one to three, whatever else it was. And at some point, they say, oh, you're a good guy to go home. We changed that system. And now we have a system where we have a, a solid number, one number, five, and then five years of community supervision. So when someone says someone was, quote, paroled, in a lot of people's mind, that means someone decided to let them go which may not be the case, but they're under supervision. So you're not even really parole officers anymore, you're technically community supervision officers. Is, th is that right? That's a new term, sir. Okay, yeah, so, um, so I wanna make sure that you understood my criticism earlier about the compasses room was not directed at you or anybody who does your job. It was entirely directed at the parole board which when getting that instrument is not following the law that we wrote about how to use it. It had nothing to do with the way that you hardworking men and women do your job. So I'll be very clear about that, okay? Thank you. Now, um, I, 
You seem to have new presidents on a regular basis at the PEF. I just want to share that with you. You seem to roll through them. I don't criticize you for that, but um, I've met with the previous ones, and now your new one has asked for a meeting with me with, I believe, people in the parole department. Are you on the list? I will see you next week, sir. Oh, I'm, see, now he knows my schedule better than me. I'm very happy because you clearly know quite a bit about the way that works, and I want to assure you that I have the utmost respect for the people who do your job, and I will do everything I can to help you do your job better. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Gallivan. Uh, uh, thank you, and thanks to all of you for, for your work, your members' work, and your testimony. Uh, Senator Nazolio covered much of what I had wanted to cover, um, so I'll spare two of you. But, Officer Rigby, if I can follow through on, on the discussion regarding the, the uh, caseload ratios. So first tell me, so a parole officer, an individual is released from prison and is assigned to your caseload. What is your responsibility? Well, prior to the indiv individual being released from the facility, he has that compass uh, risk and needs assessment tool done. No, let, let me ask, just, yeah, I just want to know I'll get into Compass, okay. but I just want to know what is the responsibility, what does it mean when you're supervising a parolee? Well, when they're first initial release, they come to your office, you go over their rules and regulations, you talk about their housing, you talk about their needs, you talk about their goals. You take a look at what they need to have happen. Uh, we want to refer them to DSS. I know the department's been working tirelessly trying to get Medicaid on board, but each county is a little different, and trying to have those services available. So we take a look at you know, their history. Uh, they might have a substance abuse history. We'll refer them to you know, substance abuse treatment. They might be a domestic violence guy. Refer them to treatment. Uh, so after we get our first initial referral set up, we'll say, hey, come back and see us next week. This is my report day. We go out and we visit them in the community. We make sure they're staying where they're supposed to be staying. We meet with the family and make sure they're transitioned and they hit home where they're supposed to be. If they're homeless, we're working with them. Hey, who do you know? Because a lot of times they don't know someone. They might run into somebody on the street and say, hey, Johnny says he can t take me in. He's my friend. Then we go take a look at that house. Uh, we, we refer them to a lot of different programs, the Department of Labor, so they can help find work. So we're trying to prioritize with them and meet with them to address their needs and to help them to stabilize themselves because those first eight weeks are crucial. So the, the initial first eight weeks depends on the compass score. We meet them weekly. But then where the disconnect comes through, uh, Senator, is after that, because then Compass kicks in, and then that determines when we got to see them again. The level ones and twos are high risk, maybe not so much the high needs, I would argue sometimes, and we still see them on a monthly basis. But where we're losing the battles, and I cannot stress enough, are the threes and fours that are being supervised by one parole officer to 80 parolees on the threes, one parole officer to 160, because I can't tell you the look in their face when we say, come back and see me three months, come back and see me four months. We were their crutch, and now you just took that crutch away from them. And that's the difference between nowadays with the Compass and prior, because they can rely on us for one full year, and after one full year, if they did well, they earned their way back down to lower level of supervision. Because we all want them to have lower level of supervision. We all want them to succeed. All right, so, so now we get to the, the level fours that have the 160 to one ratio. Over the course of a four month period, you're seeing them once every four months? Twice. You see them okay. once in the office and once at home. And, and how, much, how much time does that involve? Well, I can tell you, uh, the once in the office visit might be five, 10 minutes. The once at home visit, might take an officer five, six, seven days. And here's the problem, because when you have this disconnect and the parolee is not supposed to change his residence unless we know about it, the parole officer might go to his house two months from now, knock on the door, the guy is not there. He tries Ben two weeks later, goes there, he's not there. Goes up again, and next week, he's still not there. We finally talked to mom, mom says, no, he moved last week, he didn't tell you. And so there's a lot of wasted time trying to catch back up with these guys. And a lot of times they're trying to, to hide from us because they know they relapsed on drugs. They know they did something wrong. And we're no longer proactively supervising these people. The parole officers making their standards, but I can tell you they're not being supervised based upon the new company. Yeah, let, let me, for the sake of time, and I agree with Senator Nazolio that um, I, I wish we had much more time today to talk about this, um, but, but of course there's other speakers and we can follow up separately. 
what, what I, what I want to get to is, so you're five, ten minutes, once or twice a month, with an individual that has committed what types of crime? The Compass Level 4, because Compass uses age as a primary uh, factor on weighing out stuff. A lot of those guys are guys who committed murder, homicide, robbery first, because they're the guy that just did 25, 30 years in the facility. Okay, thanks. And they're a little bit older. Now, now here's the problem, though. Is no, the guy, no, time-wise, I'm sorry. Sorry. And then, then, I'll, then I will let you finish. Um, is the Compass instrument the only thing that determines, determines those caseload ratios? Yes, Compass is the primary driving right. factor. Thanks. And then finally, you mentioned two different areas, which I believe is why everybody should care. And it doesn't matter where you start. You could start with the community that I care about and talk very briefly why this is wrong and we're failing the community and in helping to ensure community safety, public safety. And we all also care, I believe, about rehabilitation and reducing recidivism. And you mentioned that we're failing the inmate. Finish with commenting on both of them, please. I will. Uh, it's kind of plain and obvious to see that community safety is jeopardized when we're not seeing these people on a regular basis. If we can catch them when they first relapse to drugs and they first start violating their curfew, I always believed in, in the mantra that I always sweated the small things in the small conditions because we took care of all the small things, we never had big things. You know, so if I kept them, you know, for the first year doing the right things, they relapse, I talk to them, I give them to them a little more treatment, it kind of corrected itself. You know, so by keeping these people involved in programs, help them find the jobs, help them be, become productive, they're less likely to engage in new criminal behavior. You heard the commissioner talk about all these educational programs. We try to also send them to educational programs, vocational programs in the community. Now, on the flip side, uh, that's about the parolee. Uh, the community sa supervision or safety part is hand in hand there. Parolees are committing crimes because they're not being supervised the same way they used to be supervised, Senator. We do not have an adequate amount of parole staff supervising these people. Our ratio is at an all-time high right now. And if that Compass Risk and Needs Assessment was so perfect, why do I always have to override all the sex offenders? They come up as three or four as low risk. I always got to override them. Why am I always overriding the domestic violence cases? to make them a higher level. Because it, it does not ask the right questions, it does not assign the right amount of supervision, and that's the problem we're having today, sir. All right. It sounds like you have an impossible task and it's very troublesome. Uh, none of it, I mean, falls on the shoulders of your officers, uh, but we recognize the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Assembly. So I have a couple questions, and I'm going to start at the left and work to the right, and I'll be as quick as possible. First of all, Nikki, I, you heard my comments earlier uh, when, when the director was speaking. Um, I do want to continue to follow up on that. I have a great challenge when we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in overtime on consultants because I don't know if the supervision is there. We all agree, and you admitted it yourself. There's going to be a time and a place, but it shouldn't be the practice all the time, and I do agree. That middle level is a great opportunity to grow committed uh, employees um, in this department. <clears throat> Stephen, in regards to uh, the salary disparity you're talking about with the professionals, the nurses, the pharmacists, whatever it may be, what is the disparity percentage-wise between what the market is bearing and and where they're 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 being uh, compensated at? I, I mean, it varies Goldman. across the board. Yeah. You know, um, across the state, but like in Central New York, where I work. You know, our biggest competitor competitor is SUNY Upstate, and you know they offer thousand eight ten thousand dollars more than the salaries that we can pay in the local facilities, okay. and it can we compete against you know local hospitals as well who offer they may offer um, different programs for them that we can't offer, and we start you know nurses are way underpaid we can't compete we can't even honestly we can't even get um, extra service or. Um, outside services to come in into a lot of our facilities as well. All right, thank you. And Paul, um, as a gentleman who was privileged to be mayor of a small city for 13 years and one who represents five cities now, um, the coverage criteria you were telling me absolutely scares the life out of me. Um, I appreciate all the work that all of you do. I would like to know, and a follow-up, and Nikki knows how to get a hold of me, she sees me regularly. 
a little bit more detail on the coverage area, particularly here in the capital region. Um, you guys play a very interesting role. You, yes, your enforcement to a degree, but your guidance and your support. And let's face it, when individuals are released from facilities, they're, they're, they're getting their feet back on the ground and they need the support as much as possible. And at the same token, I can tell you that I have mayors calling me regularly saying, because cities n naturally will attract many people being released. They, they usually return to where they came from. And that's where most of the crime tends to be, unfortunately, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. And, and there's a frustration at the local law enforcement level, which I know you guys work well together, but still it's a challenge. So I am very interested in greater detail, particularly with here in the capital region. Thanks for all the work that all of you do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Savino. Thank you, Senator Young. I will be brief. Um, you know, last night your president uh, was here. You were with him, uh, the vice president, and you and during the workforce hearing, and a lot of the discussion was around the shortage of staff in the, all of these agencies and the difficulty that your your members now face meeting the demands of these agencies, whether it's parole or docs or OCFS or OMH, OPWDD, and the list goes on and on. Um, we heard earlier tonight from the docs, earlier today from the docs commissioner, that overtime is a little bit less than last year, and that everything seems to be okay. But I get the sense that that's not necessarily the case. Um, I understand that there's a real problem with attracting and recruiting and retaining medical professionals in docs. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, I, I think last, there, there used to be this poor nurse, I'm not going to name her name, but she would always list the highest overtime in the state at Bedford Correctional. Uh, facility. I think she finally retired, thank God. But, you know, I'm con seriously, <laughs> thank God for her. But I'm seriously concerned about the ability of your members to deliver medical care in our, in our facilities, to be able to track parolees, to be able to deal with the developmentally disabled, to plan or to handle engineering. Um, and this is, so agency by agency we're seeing this, but this is a real problem. It's the number of staff and the number of, and the ability to recruit and retrain quality staff. I mean, do you guys have, can you give us any sense of how short staffed you are in these three divisions? Go ahead, you go first. Bob. I'll start. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you look at our Biffle, uh, when you look at the warrant suit they did in Brooklyn, uh, and they caught the 59 uh, pro absconders, they were short 37 pro officers prior to the last recruit class coming out. So when you wonder why you know, they caught 59 out of 200 is because no one was looking for them for a while because they were down 37 items. Mm -hmm. you know, the problem is right now, using the new pro math, when they say one officer can supervise 160 people, prior to Compass, that was four officers supervising those people. So if you use their new math, their math is going to say you know, that we might be down 10%. But if you use the old math, it's, we're probably down about 45%. Mm -hmm. I mean, our ratio right now is one parole officer per 55 parolees, where before it was right around one per 38. Mm -hmm. You know, so our staffing levels are down dramatically. And the commissioner alluded to two uh, academy classes this year. I did not see that in the budget. I'm not sure where he's getting that from, but I did not see the two academy classes for parole officers in the budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the, uh, conceivably, there are some positions that can be contracted out. Uh, some things can't. You cannot contract out parole supervision, right? Correct. Exactly. So there, there is a, you know, there, there's a case to be made that this budget doesn't really reflect the needs of the agencies or the responsibilities that have to be delivered by these agencies and your members. From our standpoint, in the facilities, I, can, I can't give you the actual number, but I know there's a mm -hmm. 200 and some plus uh, new uh, full-time employees that they're adding, and a large portion of them are uh, mm -hmm. medical services. But the ability to recruit and bring those people in to fill those is, is nearly impossible. I mean, our facility just underwent a $30 million renovation um, with the plan, hopefully sometime in the next couple of months, to open that new wing for uh, inmate care. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be looking for, well, we're right now we're short 12 nurses. And with the new increase, we'll be looking for almost 21 nurses mm -hmm. in our facility. Unbelievable. Thanks. I just want to, I constantly want to get it on the record that the agencies are drastically understaffed and that hiring has got to be a consideration, uh, not just for, you know, the administration of the mission of the agencies, but for the safety of the staff as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a comment and a question. Um, I share 
Senator Savino's concern about understaffing and especially about the medical understaffing. And in 2016 budget, this year's budget, the legislature felt so strongly about mental health services in the prison system because as you know, we've seen real life tragedies where people have been severely injured and killed um, by inmates who have left the system without the supports that they need within the system and outside. And so apparently $18 million of that funding has been expended to treat the psychiatric prisoners who have violent tendencies. Have you seen that happen? Because it's, it's concerning to me to see that there was an MOU between OMH and DOCS which expired in 1999. That's incredible to me that outlines the duties of the nurses between psychiatric nurses and regular nurses. Could you expound on that? And my question also, have you seen any changes over the past year uh, regarding that issue and are there additional um, measures being taken or is there additional attention to the psychiatric prisoners and how does that affect your members? 